Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Cornerstone Time of uh, Evening Worship. I trust you are keeping well and keeping safe. Uh, it's good to be together this evening, and I do want to thank you very much for inviting me into your home for this time together. Uh, as we come together this evening, it is to seek the Lord and to worship him. So let's begin with a word of prayer together. Father, we do want to thank you that you are the God who uh, hears and answers prayer. We thank you that we are always able to call upon you and that your ear is always open to our cry. And uh, Father, as we come this evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you, uh, dear Lord, please to reach down to us so that we might reach up to you. We ask you, Lord, to draw near to us so that we might draw near to you. We pray, dear Lord, that our worship might be in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that we might, uh, by the Spirit of God, know uh, the presence of the Lord Jesus in our midst and that our hearts might be warmed as we meet together. And so we uh, commit our time now to you, Father. Uh, may we know your blessing and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first song. So we move on to our reading, and our reading this evening is taken from uh, John's Gospel and chapter 11, a very exciting passage. We read from verse 1. 
Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad order, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that uh, you are the hearer and uh, the responder to our prayers. We come to you this evening in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have of being together in this unusual way. We thank you, Lord, that you are able to reach down to us just where we are. And so we ask that as you do so, so we might reach up to you, dear Lord. We ask you to uh, draw near to us uh, so that we uh, might draw near to you. 
And Lord, we come again this evening to bring our troubled world to you, asking you please to comfort those who mourn. We pray, Lord, for those in families who carry heavy burdens and those who are and feel alone at this time. We remember our secular leaders, uh, not only locally, but nationally, and pray that they might seek your help and your wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above, in the difficult decisions that they have to make. We pray for those with special responsibilities in the field of medicine and education and other areas of life. May they seek and find strength and renewed courage from yourself. We pray for protection for those who work, whose work exposes them, Lord, to increased danger. We pray for one another. We pray for our church leaders. We pray for our church family. Lord, we bring before you our neighbours and our friends. We bring to you, Lord, our loved ones, near and far. We pray that in the darkness and the difficulty of our times, uh, your church, your people, would reach out in love with the light of the gospel, thanking you for every opportunity that these circumstances present. Thank you, indeed, that you are the prayer-answering God. Thank you that you are a good and gracious God. Thank you that in life and in death we can trust you. Thank you for this new opportunity to look at your word together. May its truth not only warm our hearts and lift our spirits, but draw us close to you. Our Heavenly Father, may the Spirit of God come to open our eyes and touch our lives, pointing us to Jesus, our Lord. Jesus, stand among us in thy risen power. Make this time of worship truly a hallowed hour. Father, equip us for the days in which we live. Grant your blessing wherever we are tonight in our respective homes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, uh, we turn to John chapter 11. Uh, this extraordinary passage and um, I remember that some years ago I think it was oh, back in the 19, 1950s that a book uh, was produced by uh, an Anglican um, a Church of England vicar and um, he was also a, a Bible scholar and he wrote many books and one of them that he wrote during this time was entitled Your God is Too Small. His name, of course, was J.B. Phillips. Now, irrespective of its contents, I liked the title Your God is Too Small. And I want to take the challenge of it uh, by turning to John chapter 11. It's a passage that demonstrates something of the greatness and of the glory of God. And look at verse 4. Look at verse 40. This is the God who himself had thrown out a challenge to the people of Isaiah's day. Do you remember that in chapter 40 he asks the question, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? And earlier in the book of Genesis he'd come to Abraham, that remarkable man of faith, do you remember? And... Uh, he spoke to him, Abraham, and uh, who was at that time in, in, in difficult, strange, almost hopeless circumstances. Uh, he spoke to, to um, Abraham, and the question he asked him was this, Is anything too hard for the Lord? In other words, remember who I am, the Lord God Almighty. It has been said that it is impossible not to believe the impossible, if you believe in a God for whom all things are possible. The God of the Bible, the Christian God, declares himself to be such. He reveals himself to Moses as I am. That is the, the eternal, self-existent, unchanging, unchangeable, one true and living God. 
So take note in this passage, uh, the miracle, the whole incident in chapter 11 declares to us that Jesus is God. God manifest in the flesh. Throughout the New Testament, we discover that when Jesus spoke, it was not from, from God, but as God. Hence the miracles. Think, for example, the way he commanded the man with the withered hand to stretch out his hand, and he did so. The way he spoke to the cripple and told him to stand up and walk, and he did so. Remember the storm at sea, uh, where the disciples were terrified. And uh, when they awoke him, he stood up and he calmed the sea and the waves. You remember what we've got here in this passage, the extraordinary miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. So on and so forth. And so it's totally appropriate that... Uh, when he was being questioned by his those around him uh, about his identity, he takes for himself God's name when he says, Before Abraham was, I am. Of course, he does so again and again in this very book, doesn't he? In John's Gospel, you find him saying such things as, I am the door, I am the light, I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth and the life. And here, of course, I am the resurrection and the life. Remarkable claims, remarkable statements. Here is the one who said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. There you have it in John chapter 14. Listen to the opening of John's Gospel, what it says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. And then, just a few verses down, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Take note of what Jesus says about himself. I remember many years ago when I was teaching in Gloucester, I uh, had a good friend, Eric, and uh, we got to know each other quite well. He wasn't a Christian, uh, but he showed an interest, and uh, over a period of time we talked more and more about the Christian faith. It went on for some time, uh, and uh, I eventually thought, well, we're not really getting anywhere with this, so... It's time to produce some sort of challenge to him. And I said, well, look, Eric, if you really are serious about this and you are interested, I challenge you to go home and uh, every every day read a little of, of one of the Gospels. And if you're not convinced about who Jesus is by the end, then uh, we'll forget all this. He took up the challenge. And before very long, within a couple of weeks, he came back to me with a smile on his face one day and he said, Godfrey, he said, I am convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and I have become his follower. I have become a Christian. Well, that's very wonderful. I wonder if you're not quite sure tonight as to who Jesus is. Can I suggest that you take up the New Testament and you read it with an open mind, asking God just to show you who Jesus really is. Because when you find who Jesus is, you discover who God really is. And that's what I'm uh, drawing your attention to this evening, because I just want to mention three things that Jesus shows us about God in this passage. The first one is this, that in Jesus we see the love of God. Or perhaps it would be better to say we see the God of love. The Christian faith is about a God who understands us, a God who understands human sorrow and suffering and pain, not theoretically, not as a, a sort of compassionate onlooker, but actually, practically, experientially. In Jesus, we are assured that we do not have a remote God, uh, a God who 
keeps his distance. A God who stands aloof, who's not really interested. Uh, no, the Bible assures us, as has been put by various writers, uh, he's the God not only of the stars, but he's the God of the scars too. Jesus, a man with emotion and with tears, Look at verse 35, look at verse 36, look at verse 38. We discover that here he wept out of sympathy, sympathy for his friends whom he loved. But he wept also, recognising the sense of desolation and loss that death brings into a family. In Jesus, we see an understanding and a sympathetic and a caring God. This is the Jesus who knew what it was to experience pain in his body, anguish in his heart and tears in his eyes. His life was, uh, in his life were brought to him uh, ridicule. He encountered scorn and derision, rejection, injustice, barbaric cruelty and, of course, an horrendous death. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 5 says to us that his experience perfectly equipped him to understand, to understand the temptations and the trials, the problems and the pressures of life here in a fallen world. He's been here. He's felt it. He knows what it's like. He understands. This is Jesus, the God-man. And then, of course, remembering that on Thursday, I think it is, we, we remember Ascension Day. Incredibly, this same Jesus took his humanity, all his human experience, back to heaven where he now is able to be a sympathising and empathising great high priest. In the throne room of the universe is no autocratic dictator, no cruel tyrant, uh, no God, as it were, in absentia, but one about whom John makes the profound statement in one of his letters, that God is love. Not just loving, but love is the very essence of his being. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we find one touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We discover a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Is it any wonder that in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, 10. John uh, refers us to Jesus who spoke of himself as being the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. See, the good shepherd doesn't run away. He doesn't run away when the thief comes or when the wolf comes or when trouble appears. He stays around. Why? He knows and he loves his sheep. In Jesus, we find the love of God clearly displayed. We find the God of love displayed. So secondly, I want you to notice that in Jesus, we find the wisdom of God. Look at verse 6. After hearing that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the place where he was for two more days. Look in verse 21, we discover Martha. And in verse 32, we discover Mary saying the same thing. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Of course, there's a real element of faith in what they are saying. But there's a real element of disappointment, isn't there, that comes across. If only, if only. How many times have we not said that and felt that? I do not wish to appear naive or simplistic, certainly not a cold, 
because I know there is so much in life that is awful. There's so much in life that we just fail to grasp or to understand. There is that which makes us weep. There is that which makes us cry, cry out in pain or even in anger. I would never wish to deny or to play down the problem of evil or the reality of suffering. It has come too close to my own life for me ever to have superficial answers to such things. Indeed, there are so many uh, questions that simply cannot be answered at this stage. But my friends, the bottom line is this. As this passage demonstrates, God knows what he is doing and why he is doing it. Let me read to you some lovely verses from Isaiah chapter 55. God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yes, the bottom line is, as this passage demonstrates, that God knows what he is doing and why. His purposes will come to fruition. His hand, God's hand, is upon history at every point. Remember Paul writing in Galatians and in chapter 4, he says this, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, for those who are under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. See, God, back in eternity, was planning a day and a time that was appropriate and that was right for Jesus, the saviour of sinners, to come into the world. He had, it, he had it all in hand. And at the right time, he produced the right person, the saviour, his son. Or think of Paul this time preaching in, in the book of Acts, words that are recorded in uh, chapter 17 of that book. It says He says this, God has set a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has appointed, that is Jesus. Again, it's extraordinary that it would seem the eternal God keeps a diary, as it were, because he has a day fixed which no one knows when it would be. He has a day when he will come in judgment. God working his purposes out. God is never confused. God is never baffled. God is never outwitted. God is never overthrown. He never, has never lost control of himself or the situations around him. In all the changing scenes of life, he remains the omnipotent God, the all-powerful one, but also a compassionate and a loving God. And these truths, as revealed in Scripture, must be held together as we worship this wonderful God. Many in the present and in the past bear witness to the fact that in Christ we find the God who can be trusted and trusted not only in the light when we can see and make sense of everything that, ha that is happening but also in the dark when we are confused, when we are hurting, when we don't know what's going on, when we can't make sense of things. Surely the Easter events, the cross and the resurrection, these events provide a supreme example that God can do and does bring good out of evil. Do you remember how uh, Peter preaches about you, uh, the hand was, was by wicked hands, wicked men took this Jesus and nailed him to the cross. But, but God raised him from the dead. There was evil, but there was also God bringing good out of that evil in a quite extraordinary way. 
so that we might benefit. God, God to be trusted. He is the God who is not only loving, but he is the God who is wise. Thirdly, we find that in Jesus, we discover, we, we find, we are shown the power of God. Martha, well, she was a, a busy, practical woman. That's how we see her and perceive her, isn't it? No doubt she'd prayed that God would save her, her loved one from death, only, for, only to find that it hadn't worked out that way. She must have been confused and sad and hurt, disappointed, maybe a touch of resentment even, that the Lord hadn't been around, that he delayed, that he hadn't turned up. You have here, don't you, what is a real human situation? Have you ever felt like that? I certainly have. We have a real human situation here and Notice that it's one that makes Jesus weep. But also, there's a much bigger picture here. The Lazarus miracle is an illustration. Or to put it another way, it's, it's, a, it's a foretelling of something hugely significant and completely relevant for each and every one of us. You know, it was the Greek philosopher Aristotle who said that death is a terrible thing. It is the end. Have we not in the last few weeks or, or months even, have we not all been brought closer to the reality of, of death? It seems to be on the agenda, doesn't it? Much more than usual. Of course, it's always around, but Circumstances are different at the moment with this virus. Highlighted has been the fact that it is no respecter of persons. It is no respecter of age, for old people die, but young people die too. Unhealthy people die, but healthy people also die. People who are not so clever die. But also very clever people die. Poor people die. But rich people die too. Successful people die as well as unsuccessful people. Yeah. He's no death is no respecter of age, fitness, ability, money or success or any other thing. It is what the Bible calls the last enemy. It is an enemy. It's not, it's not morbid. It's just being real. It's just being realistic to say that sooner or later it is certain for us. It will catch up with us. That's the way we're all going to go. That's love. But it's not only certain, it's also cruel, isn't it? Think of the enormous sadness that's around at the moment, the people who have been lost. It's sad because it separates us from loved ones. Aristotle was right, wasn't he, when he said, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing because it feels us feeling not only sad, but but helpless and hopeless. So it's really interesting, you know, to find that in this passage, Jesus shows more than genuine sorrow and sympathy for those who had been bereaved. Important as that is, the God of compassion, he wept to see their loss and to feel their loss. That's important, but there's more than that here. Look at verse 33. Translated, Jesus was deeply moved. Deeply moved. 
there's something else here. Commentators would talk about there being a groaning, there being an anger. And it was to do with the iron grip in which death holds us. B.B. Warfield, the theologian, says this, It is death that is the object of his wrath. Jesus is angry with death and with he who holds the power of death, the devil. It's the great John Calvin who said that Jesus advances towards the cross, I quote, as a champion who prepares for conflict. We know that when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he knew that he was entering the arena. And it was to be a bloody battleground, wasn't it? Aristotle was right. Death is a terrible thing. But Aristotle was also wrong. Because look at verse 25 and 26. The words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Extraordinary words, aren't they? Extraordinary. Here, in this passage and at the cross, we find the authentication of this remarkable claim that Jesus made. For on Easter Day, after being cruelly whipped, after being beaten up by Roman thugs, after an horrendous crucifixion, after having been laid in a tomb, another man's tomb, after having the stone placed across the entrance and a guard positioned to stop anyone interfering with the body, up from the grave he arose. My friends, that is what the Bible teaches. That is what the evidence suggests. My friend, it more than suggests. That is where the evidence leads. And that is what Christians believe. Death could not hold him. For God raised him from the dead. The gospel is God's counter-strategy against the last enemy, death. The one true and living, omnipotent God of love declared that death should not have the final say. Yes, death is certain. Death is cruel. But death has been conquered. Praise God! What a message to proclaim in these days, folks. What a truth to get across to people. You know, we can do much for a person when a person is alive. We can go so far with a person when they are alive. But at death, you have to say goodbye. It's a parting of the ways, isn't it? We can't go any further. But you know what I've said at funerals many times? There is one. There is one who can accompany us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thou art with me. The cause of death is sin. And that sin has not only affected humanity, it's also had an effect upon creation itself, which is red in tooth and claw. My friends, Jesus dealt with sin. Do you remember the message, the Christmas message? 
you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus dealt with sin. At the cross, he took its penalty. He paid its price. He broke its power. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. He died that we might live. John Owen, the great English theologian of a past, long past gone day, John Owen produced a book that was titled The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. That's lovely, isn't it? The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. So, my friends, we say that here Jesus makes a statement and he makes a promise. I am the resurrection and the life statement. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. A promise. A statement from the mouth of God himself. A promise from the mouth of God himself. One Puritan writer has said, we are more sure to rise from our graves than we are from our beds. I like that. Such is the power in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. In Christ alone my hope is found, goes the modern hymn. My hope, hope, hope. Oh, hope is so important, isn't it? Hope, but you know, when the Bible talks about hope, it's not talking about some sort of optimistic possibility, something that might happen or might never happen. Rather, it's talking about something sure and certain. It's a glorious hope. It's a wonderful hope. And what's most wonderful about it is that it's true. Yes, you have here a statement and you have here a promise that comes from God. But you also have a question that comes from God. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Is God, is your God big enough, loving enough, strong enough to be trusted? To be trusted in life, to be trusted in life with all of its complexities, its heartaches, its issues. It's mistakes, it's regrets, it's sorrows, it's failures, it's sin, our sin. Is he big enough, loving enough, strong enough to deal with this? To deal with us in life, to be trusted in life? And is he also one who can be trusted in death? Do you know what heaven's answer is? Heaven's resounding answer is yes. Yes, he can be trusted. The Lord Jesus Christ can be trusted. Do you believe this? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe this? can believe it this very night. May God bless you, just where you are. Amen. See what a morning, gloriously bright with the
the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Oh, did the grave clothes tomb fill with light as the angels announced Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan wrought in love, born in pain and paid in sacrifice. Fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. See Mary weeping, where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb. Speaking, calling a name, it's the Master, the Lord, who raised to life again. The voice that spans the years, speaking life, stirring hope, and bringing peace to us. Will sound till he appears, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. of days through the spirit who clothes faith with certainty honor and blessing glory and praise to the king crowned with power and authority and we are raised with him death is dead love has won and christ has conquered and we shall reign with him for he lives Christ is risen from the dead and we are raised with him death is dead love has won and Christ is conquered and we shall reign with him for he lives Christ is risen from